I'm new here. Like seriously, if you're, if you're a guest here at Rock Harbor, I want to welcome you. I'm new too, because I've been gone for like three weeks. And I forgot to turn my mic on. Yeah, let's give it up for the sound who had it right, but I had it wrong. Yes. Well, hey, welcome today. I'm very excited about jumping into 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you have your Bibles or phones, I invite you to turn there or to the app. Uh, Before we get there, I want to talk about something that's coming up this fall. It's called Rooted. So on September 8th, we are going to be launching into what it's called Rooted. It's an 11-week, every single weekend at the service. We'll be preaching, teaching on that. We're also going through it in groups. And so we'll have like total alignment within uh, the church, which is very excited. Our theme for the year is deeply rooted out of Romans 12. And so rooted fits right in with that. It's, a, it's an opportunity for a Bible study. It's an opportunity to grow deeper in relationship. But it's also a chance for us to step up into leadership because we need about 30 new groups to launch. And so maybe you're in a group, but you're going, hey, I could lead a group. Maybe God's calling me out in to do that. Or you've led in the past, but now you're part of one, but you could step into leading. We would absolutely love to have you uh, lead a group come this fall. The reason I'm telling you now is because there's an opportunity on the Next Step card today. Whether you're here or you're at the hub or you're online, you can mark and say, hey, I'm interested in being a group leader for Rooted. What you're not doing is signing your life away without knowing what that exactly means. And so it's just information about what it means to lead a rooted group. And so pray about that. But if you know, like, I could do this, then let's do it. Maybe there's three, four individuals within a group that could lead a group. We would love to see 30 more step up and, and into that. So we also have training that are, that's coming up in August. That's why we're talking about it now. But this is an exciting time in our church. Um, there's a guy by the name of Scott Nolan, and I want to show a picture of him for just a second because this dude, yeah, this guy, he's been at our church. He and Andrea and Ella, they've been here since Day one, like literally when there were 30 people sitting in these front three rows, we weren't on stage, we were standing on low, it was like a guitar and it was two turntables and a microphone back then, okay? But we were here, Scott and Andrea were invested and and serving here. About a year later, Scott came on our staff team and I bring it up because there is camp this week, okay? Middle school camp is going on, seven, eight camp is is tomorrow and then we have the sixth grade launching that new sixth grade camp uh, that next weekend. And Scott's been such a great asset to our team and I have a current picture of him. He hasn't aged very much uh, since he came on, uh, but we absolutely love having him be a part of it. be praying for them. I, did anybody have fun with the Face app this week? Anybody download it? Anybody do a little something with it? It's fun, man. We had, I had a good time um, with it. Uh, but I, I got this picture of my wife and I, and I thought I'm going to run it through the Face app, and I just thought, okay, this is, you know, interesting, you know, Whatever, and I had a sweatshirt on, so you can't tell that in 30 years I'm still going to be chiseled um, like I am right now. But it, 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 this picture actually kind of like threw me for a bit of a loop. And here's why, because I, I looked at it and I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to get older someday, you know. And I've looked at pictures seven years ago before Rock Harbor started. I'm like, you guys took like most of my hairline. Um, I mean, I love this church. And... Um, but when I saw this picture, it just, I actually had kind of like this weird kind of moment thinking about journeying with Christ. Man, if I look like that in 30 years, that's good. Um, more importantly, in 30 years, to think of the life at 51 years that my wife and I will have lived, wow. I also started thinking about about a year ago, we did some vow renewals on this stage with a, with a few couples, some, you know, 50 years, 58 years, 35 years, just the glory of aging, but not just with someone, because I know some of us, we've been through some hard things, but aging in Christ, because it's not about that other person that might be in the picture. It's about like, are you aging well in Jesus? Because that's glorious. And today I'm going to be talking about sacred scars. And there is some pain and some suffering that goes along with being a devoted follower of Jesus. It's not just Jesus loves me, Jesse does, Jesus loves me, what's up cuz? I made that up, but just like literally now and I will not say it again. Um, It's not just like, hey, I found my joy in Jesus and I'm good and now I'm just going to make a comfortable life here and then someday I'm going to be with him. No, devoted followers of Jesus will go through scars and suffering and, and difficult, difficult time. Paul, the man who's writing this letter to this church, 
He went through it. Brandon talked about it a few weeks ago and said he bore the scars of the cross on his body. And that when you would look at him, it was difficult to even look at that man because of his physical, like, it was disturbing what he'd been through. He even mentioned he had a unibrow, you know? <laughs> that, that's just funny. Um, but Paul bore the scars of Jesus on his body. And now these false teachers are coming in and saying, no, you know what? Paul's a, he, you know, he can write a good letter, but he can't preach. You know, Paul, he can, oh, he's very, I mean, he can be really strong in his letters, but he's a weak human. And now Paul is put in a position where he has to defend himself. He's defending himself because he's actually defending the gospel. Paul would be better off, like, he's more comfortable going, you know what? I'm the chief of all sinners. I'm in first place when it comes to who's fallen short in their life. But now he's put in a position where now he has to say, you know what? I got to be real stinking with you. I've been through hell as a follower of Jesus. I've been through it and I am still battling. You false teachers, you haven't been through it. No, your words are quick. Your words are cutting. But my life is evidence that there is not only a God, but a God that loves us and sent his only son for us. For I've bore these scars on my body for the gospel of Jesus. And I'm not going to let people, wolves come into this church. I'm not going to let them snatch up the sheep. Paul is bringing it. Okay. So here we go. Verse number 18. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares... I boast about the stupidest things. He's saying if they're going to boast, then I'm going to boast. But my boasting is going to be the power of the cross. You and I do it. We, we, we'd let people know our stat line or what we did. But we do it like in a humble way. Like, yeah, that was a lot of work. We want people to know what we've done. And these people, they're wanting people to know what they've done. And all they've done is honored themselves. They're not glorifying God. I get choked up because we live in a boasting culture. We don't even, we post for reasons so that people can see what we did. Can we have a good time? Yeah. Can we say this was a great experience that I have? And yes, I love this person. But we need to check each and everything that we do and go, why am I doing this? And Paul's saying, I'm going to get very clear here because the cross is worth it. For I'm speaking as a fool, as I dare to boast of that. He's embarrassed that he even has to say that. He's feeling crazy. Listen to what he says in verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the offspring of Abraham? So am I. Heritage mattered in this day and this time. It was a little bit different then. You know, Jewish people, it's not just a religion. It's actually a group, a heritage of people. We've heard John Link talk about that. He did a DNA test and found out he's 14% Jewish. You know, and he's told us over and over. I'm like, congratulations, John. I've heard it 14 too many times. Um, but John was 13 and he got tested again. He got 14 and he's like, I'm becoming more like Jesus. And I'm like, no, you're paying too much for a scam. But anyways, um, He's excited about it, you know, but there's this heritage of that Paul has that he's saying, I qualify. In fact, and here he goes, he goes even further. He's not just saying, I'm equal with you. He's saying, I'm even greater than you. He says, are they servants of Christ? For I'm a better one. Those are strong words. And then he says, hold on, I'm talking like a madman. <laughs> he's like, I'm going to say it, but I, it really pains me to say this to you, that he has to defend his apostleship. He has to throw out his resume and his credentials. And what we're going to find with this man named Paul, it should be found in each and every devoted follower of Jesus. I didn't say a Christian. Because you can use that title Christian. It's thrown around with different denominations. It's thrown around with different people. And everybody calls themselves Christian just because they, they, they kind of believe in Jesus. And, and I'll tell you this. It's about being a devoted follower of Jesus, dedicated, 
committed, willing to do whatever it takes as unto Christ and his cross. The word is sacrifice. The first word is sacrifice that I have for you. It's one of the first scars where you make sacrifice, you put your needs aside. A true follower of Jesus is going to make a sacrifice, kind of like in John 15, one of my favorite chapters of all of the Bible. And I remember reading it when I was 17 years old and it ripped my heart out of my chest because it said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Keith, if they hated Jesus, they're going to hate you. Because I had some decisions I was going to make and who I was going to hang around and who I was going to be. And I remember going, I am choosing to be abandoned by this group of people if I do this. There's students in this place, you're going to have decisions that you're making right now in the most pivotal years of your life. You're going to have to make a decision on who you're going to follow. And there is a cost that's to that. And abandonment might be part of it and a sacrifice might be part of it. But I will tell you, as I look back and as I live it now, Every bit of it is worth it. And I make some of those same decisions now in my life. There's a sacrifice that's meant to be paid. You know what's funny? Salvation cannot be earned by works. And sadly, there's religions out there that practice it. It's about works and it's about all of these different things. No, it's not by works of righteousness that we've done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. It's only by his grace But guess what we do when we hear it's not about works? We all of a sudden think we don't have to work. There's a problem. Satan wants you to think that you don't have to serve the Lord. You don't have to work diligently. It's all been done for you by Jesus. And I have news for you. You're to be a worker. And if you're a true follower of Jesus, you will have a scratch. Or is it itch that you can't scratch? You'll have something. You'll have a rash, okay, for God. (laughs) That always exists there. That can only be filled when you absolutely sacrifice and give of yourself. You may wonder why you're restless and you're a little bit irritated and you're a little bit going, there's got to be more to this following Jesus thing. Are you working for him? Peter or Paul wrote to a man by the name of Timothy. He said, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. For a worker has no need to be ashamed. If you're working for God, you have no need to be ashamed for you've handled the word of God rightfully. If you don't work as unto the Lord and you're not diligent and you're not serving, you're not looking for ways, I'm not trying to bring a guilt trip. I'm not trying to fill up a communication card with people serving and next steps. That would be awesome, but I'm not trying to do that. The goal of this is to teach and preach the Bible and say, if we're not working as unto the Lord, there's a reason that you feel unfulfilled. There's a reason you're not experiencing these glorious scars. No, because you've made your comfort. You've made your joy. You're experiencing your heaven on this earth. And in reality, it's so much, it's so short-sighted. It's so unfulfilling. And that's why when you do something outside of your strength and outside of your might, you witness the glory of God. Serving someone that doesn't deserve something, loving the unlovely, love the unlovely, giving of yourself. I tell my kids every day they get out of, school, out of the car or going to school, I say, look for the lonely. But guess what? The lonely aren't always fun. The lonely aren't always popular. The lonely aren't always friendly. The lonely aren't always easy to talk to. Are you willing to pay a price? Are you willing to work? Because it says my laborers are more, my labors are more than theirs. Paul says, I work diligently day and night. There's a sacrifice. There's also a crushing, a crushing that happens when you follow Christ, a crushing that goes on and nobody wants this done to them, right? Nobody wants to be crushed. And there's this promise that we won't be crushed, but there is a crushing, there's a forming, there's a fashioning, there's difficulty. It says far more imprisonments. Yeah, false teachers, you've never been imprisoned like me. And I want to give you a little bit of information, okay? When Paul wrote this letter, he'd gone to jail three times. Clement wrote in 96 AD as one of these founding, like a a father in the church, and he recorded a bunch of things. He said Paul went to prison a total of seven times. And when we read this list, we're going to go, wow, he was halfway through his ministry and all these things had happened to him. Yeah, it's a crushing. 
imprisoned far more times. And the prisons were, it was different back then, okay? Jewish people didn't do prisons. They did more corporal punishment. Quakers created prisons because they thought that you would become penitent, which is where we get the word penitentiary, you know, that you would reflect on your actions over a period of time and then you would change. We know that that doesn't always work like that in the right kind of heart and with God's work that does happen, but not always just just time away, solve things in our life. The Jewish culture had a different approach to it. And these, this next part is very difficult. I'm going to let you know. It's going to be hard to hear some of the things that I'm going to share. But I want you to know, if a man was willing to suffer in this way, we as followers of Jesus, generations later, 2,000 years later, we should listen to what he went through. For lest we think our Christianity or our faith has to do with an hour on Sundays and maybe an hour on a Tuesday night. It should change us. It should make us have a different perspective about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Verse 24, it says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, lest one. To be beaten. Why 40, lest one? Well, in Deuteronomy 25, it defines that. It says, no more than 40. So the reason they chose 39 is this. That person that was giving the lashes, if they gave 39 and that person died, which often happened, they could walk away and say, hey, I was just doing my job. I didn't take it too far. I didn't go over the limit. But if they gave 41, if they gave 59, if they continued on out of anger, out of aggression, for whatever possible reason, then they were accountable for that death. It gave a standard for the punishment. And when it talks about these lashes, you know what that, what that means? That means a scourger would stand on top of a platform and the victim or the individual that was receiving the lashes would be below them. Less, that way they could get more power and more force in the cord of leather that had three strands to it 39 times. 13, one third, would go on the chest, the exposed chest. 26, two thirds, would go on the exposed back. Only 39. That way, they didn't bring them to death. And if they died prior to 39 or because of the 39, it wasn't on them. It was God's justice being brought to them. Five times this happened to Paul. That's 195 lashes on his body. So when he told the church in Galatia, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. <laughs> you want to know if Paul loved God? You want to know if Paul was dedicated? You could see it on his body. Difficult to hear, isn't it? But there's more. Verse 25, three times I was beaten with rods. This is the Roman fasces. These rods he's referring to is the Roman fasces. I have a picture of this. Do you see the strap that wraps around the rods? That's leather. Those are leather straps. It was almost like they walked into the beating with their little kit. They would take those leather straps. That's how they tied the individual up. Each one of those rods, they were a one-time use only. You know why? Because they would use the rod until it broke. And then they would set it down and take out the next rod. All of that was one beating. So when he says three times, it means a sleeve of rod was, rods was emptied on him three times. Gruesome. Inhumane, right? And for the gospel... Why the hatchet? Well, if they decided to behead the person or they made some decision, spur of the moment, or said, we're going to beat him to prove a point, and then we're going to cut his head off. Oh, I also forgot to mention they did this while hanging upside down. They would beat the feet of this person until their bones were broken in their feet, never walking the same. Keith, that's enough. You need to stop talking about this. We're in church. This might be going online, Keith. You know, there's people over at that. You know, there's children in here. <sighs> really? I am not trying to gross anyone out, trip anybody out. But I think it is important that we recognize a price that was paid. Scars that were given for the gospel. 
It's important for us to know these things. Once he was stoned, Acts 14, he was presumed dead. He was outside of the city. They left him for dead and somehow he didn't die and left the city. While, I mean, think, they thought he was dead. Somehow he got up and went to give the gospel to the next city. I'll tell you what, I'm out. Like I'm done. I'd be praying for God to take my life. Like I'm done. Like I can't do this anymore. People that you thought loved you, people that, you know, that people that you do know, people you don't know, everybody's hating you, everybody's trying to kill you. Then it says three times he was shipwrecked, a day and a night he was adrift at sea. It's recorded that Paul went on 20 voyages. At this point, he'd only been on nine. Three times. That's one third. 33.3% of the time, Paul's ship goes down. Bro, I don't know what boat line you're on, but you need to upgrade. I don't care the Star Alliance and like it's really good miles. Bad idea. You need to stop. Figure it out. I'm not getting on a boat with that guy. I'm sorry. Paul's on? Oh, I'm out. I'm not even going to Wahoos and doing bumper boats with him. Like, forget it. Like, I am not. I'll watch it. You know, like from the, the water slide, but I am not going to do it, Paul. Like, no, thank you. And he says, danger on frequent journeys, danger from rivers. Think about it this way. When, they, when he traveled, he didn't have like the weather channel. There was no forecast. It was like, you're there and all of a sudden there's a flash flood. So you're like thinking, oh, how hard is it to cross a river? And like, do you know the size of the river? Do you know what happens when it floods? Do you know the danger that ensues? And he's just trying to get the gospel to that next city. Like, he don't got no water shoes. He don't need no Crocs. He's not like, oh, I got my Crocs. I'm good. I got my Chacos. No, he's got nothing. You know, the four by four Crocs, you know, with the extra tread. He didn't even have those. It's like him, his sandals, and a branch. And he's like, here we go. Let's do it. They need to hear about Jesus. Let's get it going. You know, and he's doing the little flipper pad. It's, it's dangerous over and over again. And he's mentioning it because he's like, you guys don't think I've made any sacrifice and you're trying to say I'm not a good preacher. He's like, I'm bringing the gospel as best as I possibly can until death. Prison, doesn't matter. Danger from robbers. There was no law enforcement back in those days and time. You know, Ada County showing up and going, yeah, this is an area people get ambushed. It wasn't like that. Danger from robbers, danger from his own people, danger from Gentiles. Everybody's hating on him. Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, all places. Danger at sea. He brings up the sea again. He's brought up water three times. Oh, poor guy. I just feel bad for him. Um, danger from false brothers. That's why he's writing this letter. People lying about him. In toil and hardship, many sleepless nights. In hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. That's sacrifice. That's a crushing. But this next thing, I think many of us can relate to. Because it's relational. He's talking about things that were very physically based. But this next one, it's a whole nother level because it has to do with people. <laughs> that whole sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? He's taking the sticks and the stones, like literally. But it's the people that hurt. And what does he say? He says, for apart from other things, there's a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for the churches. Anxiety. Sacrifice, crushing, anxiety. Some of you, some of us, that have dealt with depression or anxiety, those three words can kind of define some things in your life. Sacrifice, crushing, anxiety. It's almost like a sentence. I've been through sacrifice, crushing, anxiety. I'm in sacrifice, crushing anxiety. Scott talked a couple of weeks ago and he said, uh, he read that passage that says that we should take every thought captive. And some of us would be told, like, you just need to get over it. If you really trust God, you wouldn't worry so much. God says, don't worry. Be anxious for nothing. Have you ever had a battle in your mind? Have you ever had a battle in your mind where you're trying to take every thought captive? If you haven't, you don't know. It's real. There is healing. There is hope. But it's not some simple, if you were just stronger in Jesus, you could get through this. 
No. It's crushing. And Paul's deepest anxiety that he has, I mean, he's not even scared that he's going to get murdered. He's not scared he's going to get beaten to death or imprisoned until death. He's actually has an anxiety in him for the churches. The churches that he's planted, now there's wolves in the church trying to steal up the flock. He's writing this letter from his heart. So he's willing to list his resume to save some of those sheep. I feel, I'm no Paul, but I feel some of that same pressure with anxiety for the churches. Having been here 20 years in the valley, when I've experienced different things and seen different pastors and ministries and different stuff go on, it's heavy, it's weighty. Our church, as it's grown, it's multiplied in services and knowing there's people all throughout environments in here. I have anxiety. There's a, there's a, man, Lord, we want to do your ministry. We want to teach your word. We want to train up and make disciples. We want to raise up students that are, aren't going to walk away from their faith because they turn into college, go to college and not home anymore. They're not forced to go to church. Like, God, I just want to see them hang on to their faith. I, I'm on my own children. I've got anxiety about this gospel ministry. And what you see here with Paul, you know, there is a point that you can see a false teacher. And I define it this way. A healthy church or a healthy leader, they will love people and they will use money. A false teacher like these men, a false teacher like maybe you've experienced or you've witnessed, they will use people and they'll love money. You can see it. I know I've seen it. And there's an anxiety that should exist in us where we pray against that. And there's a reason why Paul is addressing this because he's watching Christ's church be turned into a man's gathering. It has to be in the right order where there is a true love of people. You cannot use people like a commodity. God owns everything. The money will come from God. But if you start loving money, it'll change everything. Anxiety restlessness, restlessness. About three years ago, uh, we lost our, our oldest son and the church gave us a sabbatical. It was, it was an incredible gift for our family. We got to go on a 40 day trip and, uh, traveled around and 39 nights were free at people's houses and basements and it was awesome because it was free and it smelled and the last night we got a hotel and illegally jammed seven people in a room but um we were just spending time together and we got to florida and uh, just really time to reflect and rest. That's the purpose of a sabbatical. We get to Florida and we're in this uh, Silver Spring State Park. And you can see 60 and 70 feet down in this crystal clear water. We get on these kayaks and as we're renting them and we're like, okay, we've done everything for about free. Let's put a little money into this, put a couple hundred bucks. Let's do kayaks for a day, get out there, have a good time. And they're like, yeah, you're going to see monkeys and you're going to see snapping turtles and you might see an alligator. And we're like, whoa, alligator? And they're like, we've never had a situation. You're going to have a good time. It's going to be great. I'm like, Okay, there's seven of us. Odds aren't in our favor. Um, I hadn't really studied this part about Paul, but I was like, you know, thought we were safe and good. We take off, we get around the corner and this couple is coming back and they're like, we just saw an alligator. And we're like, ooh, and they're like, we're out. And we're like, okay. And we're like, let's just keep going. Let's go, you know, check this out. Next thing you know, they're following us. Basically, we were their bait. Like, hey, you guys get eaten first and then we'll turn around if it gets bad. You know, I'm like, okay, whatever. So we keep going. We're seeing snapping turtles, a few alligators. You know, it's, it's safe. It's good. Everybody's in their kayak. Uh, we get around the corner and the current starts to pick up and we're going upstream. If you follow the current, it takes you to like the ocean. And there was one kid we wanted to go, but we kind of all stuck together. Um, well, we all kind of get going and we're all... It's, it's awesome. We're having a good time, but we're actually working. Like it's no longer a sabbatical. It's like sweatical. And so we're going, then we see this couple out there, this, she's in her kayak and he's like next to his and his is bobbing up and down. We're like, what are you doing? No life jacket on. We're like, bro, this is not good. We get up to him. He's like, man, my glasses fell off and I tried to grab them and then I fell out. And I'm like, just let the glasses go. It's flip flops going. I'm like, this is a mess. Like, Dear God, this is sabbatical. Why? Anybody? 
Anybody else could have saved him, but now, well, let's see what we can do. And Chris Anna leans over and she goes, well, this looks like a date gone wrong. He goes, it's our honeymoon. And I was like, this marriage is not lasting. Like, I'm going to call it right now. But we're like, hey, dude, why don't you grab onto the back end of our kayak and we'll tow you in. And I'm like, dude, alligators. I mean, he's starting to hyperventilate. He wasn't doing good. Um, and so he's behind us. He's hanging on. And, and it's, we're going backwards. Like, dudes, like the, boat, the kayak is about 500 pounds of water. And homeboy hadn't missed a meal. And so it's not going really good at all. And so I said, hey, buddy, um, why don't you grab the back end of your wife's kayak and she can row you maybe, but we'll take your boat and then we'll come back. We'll take your kayak, we'll come, we'll figure it out. He's like, okay. And so we start going. The boys kind of hung back and kind of watched them and stuff. We get up there, we get the kayak. It was a ton of work. We get it docked. And then I look up and all of a sudden, old Randall, that's his name. She was, she's Ray. I don't think they're married, but he's on the back. They're not married anymore, um, but she is on, he's on the back of, her, of, of the boys. Our boys is kayak kicking like Michael Phelps. And I'm like, okay. I said, didn't say touch my kids, but I guess you took the liberty to just jump on the boat. And so they get up there and we try to empty out uh, the kayak. I had tried earlier, but it was, it was a tough go of things. It was, I had just done legs that day and it was about 500 pounds and I couldn't get her. Um, and so we get it dumped out and everything's fine. We took this picture just for that moment. And he gets there and he goes, I just want you to know you saved an army vet. And I'm like, that's awesome. An army vet who literally drank all of our water as well. Um, he chugged all of our water. I'm like, God bless you. We're on sabbatical. And we get around the corner like a hundred yards from that. And there is an alligator, six footer, just chilling. And I'm like, oh, wow. He, he would have eaten him. Um, but we saved him for God. And so... But as we're coming around the corner, I just had this moment just laughing and I'm like, we're supposed to rest. Now we're in a hurry to get the kayaks back because we're running out of time because we rented them. And we didn't want to pay an overage fee because we're cheapskates, you know, and so we're just getting back. And I just thought, this is life. There's a restlessness that just exists. You try to put together a perfect vacation. You try to put certain things together, have that moment. And it just isn't quite what you thought. I've thought about that story. I've thought about that situation over and over since then. I can't tell you how many times we laughed about it. We actually prayed one night at supper for Randall and Ray in their marriage and stuff. It was just funny. We're like, I don't know what happened with that. But God gave me one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given in my life as we kayaked, continued upstream. And it was this. Keith, you're not going to rest until heaven. And there are people to save. If we in our life try to create a heaven on this earth, we try to create this, this perfect, glorified, man-made creation of peace. And the peace that you're really looking for, it's only in one place. It's only from one person. And yes, we can have some peace now in a relationship with Jesus Christ, but this ultimate peace that we look for, it's going to come in eternity. And there's sacrifice that's going to come and there's crushing that happens and there's anxiety that overwhelms you and there's this restlessness of, I just want to see my Savior. I just want to know the reasons why God did my son pass away. Why God? Could I not work out this relationship? Why God can I not provide in a different way? Why isn't it easier? And we have to remember that being a devoted follower of Jesus comes with much suffering. For there are sacred scars and there is sacred suffering that takes place. And it's to God be the glory. There's glory that awaits us. Romans 8, for I consider the sufferings of this present time, they're not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed to us. The sacred sufferings of this time is not to be compared to the glory that one day will be revealed to us. And within these sacred sufferings and these hard times that we go through, there's this hope that awaits us. But we need to be careful that, you know, you and I, we can't explain every reason that we go through suffering. You can't go through a situation and then eight months later or a year later or two years later go, you know what? I figured it out. That's why I went through that. Once in a while, you get a glimpse of God's glory. Once in a while, you get a glimpse. You go through a journey. You're able to share your journey of challenge, of abandonment, or issue, whatever, the, whatever has happened. And you're able to say, hey, look at what the Lord has done. Once in a while. 
But most of the time, you don't have that answer. What if, what if your unanswered questions were answered? Guess what? Someday they will be, and they're going to be answered not by your finite mind, but no, the author, the finisher of your faith is going to answer those questions for you, and you'll receive it with a perfected mind, with the mind that's not based in the temporary, but a mind that's based in the eternal. That's what God awaits, for we, we now know in part there's a day coming that we will fully know. We can't always explain it. Also, we can't read Paul's journey without evaluating our commitment to him. How do we read what Paul did for the Lord and not go, where am I at with God? Have I surrendered my heart to Jesus? Not, am I working for my salvation? But no, have I surrendered by grace through faith for salvation? Not of my works, but now. My faith is dead if I don't work. And I work as unto him. We don't have the answers now. But we can evaluate where we're at now. And the last thing is, what if we, what if we didn't give up? We can't give up because of suffering. Here's why I have a verse Paul shares earlier in this letter. He says, for we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. I said there's a crushing, but we're not crushed. There is anxiety. There's this, we're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. For we have this hope of heaven. We have the hope of the cross. We have the hope of healing that he brings to us. We can't stop short of all that God has for it. Pain, suffering, these sacred scars are glorious in his eyes. And some of you, you have been abandoned. Some of you have been hurt relationally. Some of you have been passed over for, for prom promotions. Some of you have been set aside by friends. Some of you have dealt with grief and loss, unbearable. And those scars that you bear are sacred. And there is a sovereign Lord that knows all things. And there's someday we're going to know. But each and every one of us have a decision to make today. Do I trust him? Do I trust him even in the suffering? Can we pray together? God, we praise you for the healing, even talking about things today that this can be. God, we lift up to you those that are going through times of suffering right now. They're going through crushing right now. They're going through a time of maybe there's anxiety for some reason. Maybe they feel like they can't talk about what they're battling. God, I pray that they would not be captive in their mind, but they would be set free by the name of Jesus. Today would be a day of healing, that hope would be brought, that yes, we might have a crushing going on, but we are not crushed. We will rise up. We'll rise up by your grace. We'll rise up in community. We'll rise up for the fullness of what you have. Someday we'll get more answers. But God, you give us enough now for us to trust, for us to take that next step. And you've given us this example of Paul who gave sacrificially for you. God, for those in this place that are restless. It's all right if they're restless for the cross and they're restless for your glory, but if there's a restlessness because they're looking to acquire something that this world would offer, God, I pray they would let that down. They would open those hands. They'd open that heart to recognize the hope that resides in living a life in the now for an eternity that awaits us with you. It's in your name that we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen.